All right, so uh, I had dinner with a family this, uh, this week. Uh, we had a nice young couple over our house, uh, Ava and I, and uh, we made barbecue chicken, potatoes, like everything that is delicious and awful for you. It was awesome. And it was a really, really nice, uh, nice dinner. It was a former youth group student uh, and his girlfriend, and we were just having fun getting to know each other and uh, the, the new girlfriend. And, uh, and then it is just beautiful, nice dinner. Kids were taken care of. It was awesome. And then they ganged up on me, and uh, this lady, this girlfriend, is a, is a hairdresser, and uh, Ava's been asking about, like, hey, a haircut, like, how, let's go get the ha- my haircut, whatnot, and uh, it's going to, co- uh, I don't want to speak at, quite as loud. <laughs> All right, that's why we prayed, and... Uh, all right, so we're having dinner, and they start ganging up on me because she's a hairdresser, and I'm like, Ava, like, it's December. Like, this isn't the time of month to go and drop some Benjamins on a haircut. Like, we, you know, Christmas, the kids, think of the kids. And, uh, and then this, like, they start, like, talking, and, they, and they're like, well, how much do you spend a month on a haircut? And I was like, I don't know, like $25 every month. And they're like, well, can you multiply that by 12? And I'm like, yeah. I put it and, and they're like, well, that's more money than Ava's going to spend on her haircut. And she gets one a year. And, and then I actually went into the budget and looked at the last time she got a haircut. And it re- literally was over a year ago. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I have nothing to say. And Ava got a haircut on Friday. And, uh, and so, yeah, we... <laughs> Yeah, uh, Mike, yeah, okay, and, uh, and so that was cool, and, uh, but it's, it's funny, Ava and I oversee the budget for our family, uh, which is nothing more than me just entering into a, uh, the Every Dollar app and website, and uh, it's funny, Ava and I have talked about finances before, and there has been this, this one moment uh, where Ava was like, yo, like when I, you know, when we ask about the budget, hey, is there room in the budget for X, Y, Z? She's like, I will look at your face and how you're responding when I ask, and that will tell me if I can kind of be a little free with our spending, if you will. And so that only taught me that every time she asks if there's room in the budget, to always have a scowl on my face and be like, no, like, there's no money. We're like, we're drowning. Uh, and so, uh, but she looks at me and how I respond and then acts accordingly. And today, we're going to look at the, this next section in the chapter, uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, Jesus is born, and there's a few key players, a few who's who's, if you will, and how they respond says a lot about what they believe and what they have seen or heard about Jesus and what they think of this. And so I, what I'm going to ask, I'm going to read uh, a few verses, uh, and then we're going to kind of dive into what, how they responded. But to do this, I'm going to ask in a second that we would all stand. Now, there's nothing holy about standing. This is, this is just to do something different, to put attention on God's word, because we don't care about my opinion. Everything has to be guided through the word of God. And so I just want to put extra attention on the word of God. And so if you could, could you stand as I read uh, from Luke chapter 2 this morning? It says this, uh, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto us, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered. They were amazed at at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. Amen. You guys can have a seat. 
I want to look at four different people or groups of people and, and how they responded to the birth of Jesus. The first is, is the angels. You have one angel who's then met by, met, uh, met by a host of angels, a host of angels, an, an army of angels, but an army of angels gathered for peaceful purposes to come with a message. They're, they're declaring what they already know to be true of Jesus. That's a pretty captivating environment if you're a shepherd, isn't it? We celebrate captivating environments here. It's one of our core values. There it is. We, see, we serve a creative God. We will design environments of excellence, fun, and creativity. Because we, we believe God is important. He deserves our very best effort. And so we want, we want, to, we want to have our environments be that of excellence, that, that we show God to be an excellent God, that we don't want to do things half done because God doesn't do things half done. And so we create these captivating environments that make God the focus. And so these angels come to the shepherd. Can you kill the lights for a second? Maybe they're going to kill the lights. Imagine your angels. And, or maybe, imagine your shepherds. And, and you're sitting there. And, and you're in, in the middle of the field. All you have are the stars above. And all of a sudden the angels show up. And, and the glory of the Lord shines around you. You've never seen anything like that. You're, you're just a mere shepherd looking after sheep. And these angels come and, and, and they show the glory of the Lord. And, and the shepherd's initial response is fear. This is crazy. This is, this is, this is unforeseen. This is, well, this is just another night. But all of a sudden I'm standing before angels. And they say in the town of David is born a savior to you. David's a huge part of this. They don't say Bethlehem. They, they look at the shepherds and they say, in, in the town of David, and why would that be important to the shepherds? Because that makes this Savior automatically relatable to these shepherds. Because King David from the Old Testament, he's a shepherd. He was doing the exact same thing they're doing. He would watch after sheep. He would protect the sheep. He would, he would protect the flock. He, he would do everything that they're doing. He, he would know starry nights and watching sheep just like these shepherds. And so, no, he, the angels don't refer to Bethlehem as Bethlehem. They refer to Bethlehem as the town of David, the city of David. Because Jesus is going to be born, and he's, he, he's going to grow to be a man. And it's going to bring peace. It's going to bring good news. It's going to be this really awesome thing that will bring joy. Why? Because mankind has a need. The shepherds have a need. And the only answer is Jesus. Because if, if there's a problem, then there's an answer. And if there's an answer, then there's a problem. So to have an answer, you need a problem. First, you need a problem. I, mean, I believe Jesus is, is an answer. And so there's this problem that we have with sin. And Jesus comes to live a perfect life that none of us in this room have lived. And then he's, he, he will live that perfect life 33 some odd years. And then he'll hang on a cross. And he will die for mankind. You know what happens when he's dying for mankind? Paying the wrath. Paying the penalty that's meant for you and I. He's going to scream out. He's going to quote David himself from Psalm 22. He's going to hang on that cross. And say the first verse, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he will live the perfect life and never know the shame of God. And God's going to take out his full wrath on Jesus. Because Jesus is dying in place of you and I. You and I deserve wrath. But God took it out on Jesus. And so it's when, he, when they refer to this as good news for all, all of mankind, it is good news because you and I can't do what Jesus did. You and I haven't lived perfectly, and so we need Jesus. And so this is peace. This is God's favor for mankind. He is Jesus. He is Christ. He is Lord. This is utterly good news for you and I. And when they refer to it as good news... They're using it in the verb form. Now, this is kind of geeking out a little bit, but I absolutely love this. In the two other Gospels that this word is used, uh, Mark and Matthew, they use this, this word good news. They use it in the noun form, like this chair is a noun, this is a noun, this is a noun, yada, yada, yada. But they use good news. Luke is using good news in the verb form, that this is active. 
This is, this is in process, that, that he is going to grow to be a man. This is good news in the process of this man growing up. He will die, and he will be your Savior, shepherds. He will be the man, mankind, the universe's Savior. It's good news in action. And so these angels respond with what they know. They're put on mission, and they are utterly obedient. So their example to you and I in response to Jesus is that of obedience. But they're angels, and so we would expect that. Here's something that you might not expect. There was a young man in, in Calvary. Uh, his name was Ben. And I was running a youth group. I was there for a few years. And um, he was just, he was a nice kid, but he was one of those kids that was always just, he's a real smart aleck. He was, just, was, was a bright kid which didn't help things, right? Made him more dangerous. And we were outside one day, youth group, and uh, he was just, just trying to push my buttons, and he was just, you know, kind of not taking the Lord serious. And I walked over to him, and I went, bam! I punched him in the chest as hard as I, I crumpled the kid. I just crumpled him. And I said, I leaned over, and I said, Ben, when are you going to stop playing games with God? I led that man to the Lord right there. There's times that that might be needed. Well, we disagree. We have a different approach to ministry. And uh, I am a, uh, I'm a former youth pastor. And although parents actually at times gave me permission, like if my kid's misbehaving on their retreat, feel free to do whatever you like. I've never done that, and I don't have a YouTube video with millions. That guy actually got arrested for that after he posted it. <laughs> Josh, please, our youth leader, don't. Like, we don't ascribe to that. There's other ways to lead people to Jesus. And, uh, 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 <laughs> but you wouldn't expect that. You, you wouldn't expect a, a, a man, a, a pastor, or, or somebody in a position of authority like that in, in a church setting to act that way. But, but you do expect certain things, and, I, and I've gotten that over the last uh, 10 months or so. I've had, I've had people come up to me and say, hey, I need you to meet so-and-so because I need you to scare them to Jesus, all right? Or, or meet, meet my uncle or meet my brother or meet my friend or meet so-and-so. I need you to meet them so you can lead them to Jesus. That's great. That's an honor for me. I, I will talk Jesus till I'm blue in the face. I, it will be my last breath, God willing. But God puts you on mission too. You don't need to come to me. You can go right, you can do it yourself and tell people all about Jesus. And so the shepherd's example, although we might expect it, is that of obedience. And so are we being obedient to Jesus in response to the Savior that has been born? We then see these shepherds, verses 15 and 17. These shepherds are ordinary, ordinary dudes just living in a field. They're of no social, uh, social significance. In fact, they are just a notch above somebody that would be homeless. And the, the religious elite would never rub shoulders with shepherds because they play with animals. And in that day, in that religious setting, animals are considered, considered unclean. And so the religious would never want to rub shoulders with a shepherd. They're overlooked. Their significance in, is that really that they're meaningless. And yet that's who God says, I want you to be the first visitors to this king. I want you to go to this king and be the first one in the waiting room, if you will. Because Jesus came for all. There's no one that can't be used by God. And so the angels leave. That's like what? That was like what? A five-second conversation with these angels? Glory of God. Say a few things. God is going to be awesome. And then like, peace. They're gone. They're back to this starry night. And they're sitting there with a message. And what will they do? God can use anybody. Check out Lori's story. Hi, guys. Um, my name's Lori. Carly had asked me a couple months ago, maybe two months ago, to talk about my testimony and to share my story so that everybody could see where I was and where I am. So I'm super nervous right now, and I might cry a little, but that's nothing new because I cry a lot. Um, let me just say this. I started using heroin at age 20. I am now 43 years old. I spent about 20 years destroying my life and the lives of people around me. I knew Jesus as a child. You can't really do the two at the same time. It doesn't work out. By the grace of God, on June 29th of 2016, I wound up in Ocean County Jail for eight months. 
When I tell you I thought my life was ending, I thought my life was ending. What I didn't realize is that my life was beginning at 41 years old. Um, I always believe God puts people in your life for a reason. Somehow I wound up sharing a cell with a young black woman, completely opposite of me. She was in her 20s, she was a drug dealer, I was a drug addict, we had nothing in common. But there was something that sat above our beds, and it was Jeremiah 29 11. And I'm not really good with quoting the Bible, but it's something along the lines of, I have plans for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future. Every night I looked at this. We started talking and I started going to this group. It was a prison ministry that came in, wonderful women who I'm still friends with today. And my life started to change. I knew I wanted a life. I knew I didn't want to be a drug addict anymore. I knew I didn't want to sit in jail for eight months and not change. I had the opportunity to change because of this group that came in and because I wanted it. I wanted to live, not just exist, which is what I did basically of all my 20s and 30s. So I started changing. Time went by. I no longer had the obsession to use. Power of prayer, by the way. I got up every morning and prayed one prayer. Please lift the obsession to use drugs from my life. And one day it happened and it did. Long story short, I sat there for eight months, had many opportunities to use drugs in jail. Contrary to popular belief, they come in. I did not, I changed my life. I got out of jail, went to a church where I loved everybody, but I wasn't really comfortable, and this is how I found Wellspring. I had heard about it. One day, there was a um, Bayside, and Wellspring were giving a um, barbecue in July. And I saw it on Facebook, and I was like, I can't just show up, I don't know anybody. And the reason I'm sharing with you is, I went to church the next day and I never left. That was in July, it's now December. So if anybody out there thinks they aren't welcome or scared to show up somewhere, trust and believe the people you will meet here, you can go and show up to any of our events and be completely welcome. I wanna end with this. I'm trying to be short, because I want everybody to be captivated by this. <laughs> I see my life like this, I love good analogies. The pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is, yes, going to heaven, but I get, I get to live in the rainbow right now. My life is changed because of Jesus and knowing Jesus. And I like want to shout it from the rooftops. I share it with everyone. I'm that girl who gives the cards out constantly. I want to go back into the jail and show women you can have a life. The life that I have now, not always perfect, but beyond anything I thought possible, I wouldn't change it for the world. I love my church family. I love my life. Thank you for listening. God bless. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I have uh, spoke with Lori this week about how we can get the sermons from Wellspring into the local jail with the YouTube channel. She's trying hard and talking to people about that. Thursday night, she brought her whole family to church. You ask her if 12 months ago that would have happened, she would tell you to go fly a kite. Am I right? <laughs> Culturally, we might look at somebody that's done jail time as somebody not significant. But God looks at Lori and says, you have incredible worth. And I love you. God could have sent those angels to anybody. And he chose to go to shepherds. That was who held this initial message. He trusted them with this message. The angels up and leave. And they trusted God. The angels trusted these shepherds to go and do something about it. He trusts you and I in the same way. We talk about pray for one. We talk about waking up every morning and praying, God, give me one person to share God's love with. Give me one person to exemplify and to speak your love. Give me one. And the angels went and they did something about it. They, they hurried. They were in haste. They had a message to tell. And they didn't sit back. They didn't count the sheep. They went with haste. Are we going in haste? Are we responding to Jesus with haste and being hurried, telling this message? Because if, if we stay silent and Jesus comes back tonight, tomorrow, at some point soon, will we sit in guilt that, my goodness, I should have opened my mouth? William Fay wrote a book called How to Share Jesus Without Fear. And in it, he talks about what's something that has convicted me to my core when I read it. He says, far too often Christians are guilty of the sin 
of silence, saying nothing, walking by people every single day with this message to share, and we say nothing. So may we take the shepherd's example and respond to Jesus in haste and hurry, telling people about this wonderful, amazing thing that has happened. And they did that. And so the second, the third group of people that, we're gonna, that, we, that we have to look at is these townspeople. They, they, so it's one little verse that talks about them. It says that these people had, had wonderment, which is also likened to amazement. But here's what doesn't happen. The amazement doesn't lead to revival in Bethlehem. You've never heard of Bethlehem outside of Jesus. Nothing, nothing significant happens after this. It's a bodunk town. It remains a bodunk town. Because a whole group of people are inactively, silently amazed by what the shepherd said. And they do nothing. They, they sit and they're amazed. It's the, how many artists have some Christ, Christmas record, <laughs> but then their next CD is a whole bunch of garbage. <laughs> Do, are they really all about Silent Night, Holy Night, and then they're, you know, the, <laughs> the next CD is dropping bombs. Like, it's like, I don't know if you really believe in a Holy Night, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> or it's. It's really indicative of our society, though, isn't it? That we would be so amazed by Jesus this, this Christmas season, but remain unchanged. Jesus is cool. It's cool to get presents and give presents. It's cool to bless families, but to be unchanged. To, to say, God, you're cool until you ask something of me. God, you're cool until I read your word and, and there's something in it that I, I doesn't really dry, j- jive with me. And so, God, I'm going to keep, like, you're cool, but you're just a cool dude. Like, you're not going to be Savior. You're not going to be Messiah. You're not going to change me. I'm just going to consider you a cool guy. That you're a prophet like the other prophets. You're no, no different than Abraham, no different than Muhammad, no different than, you're just a cool figure. But I'm not going to let you change me. And so we, we look at God's word and we remained unchanged. See, for me, yeah, do I wish there were things in the Bible that maybe said things differently? Sure, that would make things culturally easier for me. But in my Christian life, I'd much rather be affected by God and his word than culture. And these are people that are affected by the culture of Bethlehem and don't let Jesus change them. They, they, <laughs> they remind me a little bit of this group of people, these hot, this hot mess here. Uh, they're known as the Kardashians. And uh, don't judge me, but I've been on, uh, on a one-way ticket to Cuddleville uh, watching the Kardashians with my wife. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, this is them all dressed up going to church. This is Easter Sunday. They're all about the Jesus on Easter Sunday, all right? And uh, you can get them off the screen now. But, but here's, here's what I know from maybe once or twice seeing that TV show is that I, you know, like, it drives me like, I, like up a wall where I'm just like so ready just to like, it's like just, I don't even know what I want to do, but I want to do something. That, and I'm like watching this show, and all of a sudden they always say Bible. Like Bible, 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 Bible. And it's this code word for saying what I'm about to say is the truth. It's not like I'm going to be trustworthy. It's if I say Bible, then I'm trustworthy. And so they say Bible, and if they're like, if, they, if someone makes a statement, they're like, say Bible. And if they say Bible, then they know that it's a true statement. And so they're like, Bible, Bible, Bible. And then they're telling their mom to screw off or things like that. And I'm like, don't yell Bible and then say that to your mom. See, these are people <laughs> that... Take God with a grain of salt and are, he's cool until he asks something of them. Jesus would grow to be a man, not stay a baby. <laughs> and he would deal with this. One day he, he says something very challenging. He says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now on surface level, that sounds really messed up. But it's the Christmas season. We're good with things that sound really messed up. I see you when I'm sleeping. I see you when, like, if I said that to your kid, you're going to punch me out. <laughs> so we're good with messed up things during the Christmas season. Let's not lie. But they don't understand it. 
And it, this happens. From, from that time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And he looks at his disciples and he says, do you want to leave me too? And they're like, no, who else can we go to? Because what Jesus was talking about was not physically eating him. It was not physically drinking his blood. He was talking about communion. He was talking about how his body would be broken, how he would bleed, and it was, it was figurative. But many didn't get it, and so they left because it was a hard thing. Has Jesus perhaps said some hard things? And have we chosen to walk away? Instead of digging down to the deeper meaning, letting the Bible affect us instead of culture affecting us. I want to be a person so affected by God and his word that I can go into the culture and bring Jesus. And so then, lastly, there's, there's Mary. And I, I love this about Mary, this peasant girl, this, this person of no social significance who, who has this child. And we talked about that just a few weeks ago. Then, and, and how is she going to remember it without a hashtag? How is she going to remember it without Instagram? How is she going to remember it without hashtag baby Jesus is here? Like, how is it going to happen? But she does. She takes the time to ponder and to remember the mom's in this room. She's no different than you. Who hasn't done that? Who hasn't taken a moment at, at a 2 a.m. feeding to hold the child, to look into the child's eyes and, and to ponder, to reflect, what, what will become of you, my child? What will life be like? What will be the hardships? What mom in this room wouldn't kill to go back to that moment at 2 a.m.? And there's Mary. This, this whole nine months has been a whirlwind. And she's sitting there holding her child. These shepherds come in saying all these amazing things. And she sits there. She ponders. She reflects. She's not in haste. She's not hurried. And she sits and she ponders. To me, that's a form of worship. To sit and say, God, fill my mind. God, take control. God, show me what you want me to, to see. So there's this difference between the, the shepherds and, and Mary, but both are equally worshipful. I've been sent this. In fact, I think it was Zach Welty that sent that, this to me. Uh, Zach, your parents are here. And uh, he sent this to me, and he was like, Jason, I see you in the front row, and you do all these things. <laughs> and it's true, I do. Like, these are different ways to worship. You the elbow flap, the, the rocky, the goal post, heart born, the dueling light bulbs, all that. I do it all because I, I'm kind of like the shepherds when I, when I get so geared with truth that I want to I want to hurry I want to I want to like worship I want to dance and oftentimes when I'm here like my mind is going a thousand miles a minute and I'm just like ah but jiggity and that's, that's a part of worship it is to a degree and whatnot but would we never get to the point where we think animated worship is the only way to worship <laughs> Mary is worshiping Jesus as she sits pauses and reflects on this child both are equally worshipful to let God control the situation, to pause and think about the object of our worship. There's a time to be animated, there's a time to be ha uh, hurried and, and boisterous, and there's a time to be still somber and reflective. And our passage concludes with the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and they had seen, which were just as they had been told, Luke 2, 20. So here's the thought for us this morning. You have four different ways of responding to Jesus. I think true, a true understanding of Jesus, if you and I truly get that this baby boy will grow to be a man, die on a cross, raised to life, giving us life in Jesus, life eternal, if we truly get that, the only proper response is that of worship. A true understanding of Jesus will always lead to worship. And so here's a scene that started with great fear. The angels come, they, they go to the shepherds, and they, the glory of God shines. And what's the, angels re or what's the shepherds' response? Great fear, great fear, but don't be afraid. What started with fear ends with worship. Because the thought of God's wrath should, in the most literal sense I can say this, should scale, scare hell out of us. It should fear us. The God that formed this world, that we at one point could be the object of his wrath. 
And so he sends Jesus to be good news that you won't be the object of my wrath for those that put their faith in Jesus Christ. This is active. This is good news. And so it can lead to worship. A true understanding of Jesus will always lead to worship. So we have four reactions. We have the angels who show, show good news in action. They're, they're, they're being obedient. You have, you have the townspeople who are onlookers. They're amazed, but they're kind of doing nothing about it. They're inactive. You have Mary treasuring and pondering. And you have the shepherds going, telling, being, let me tell you about my Jesus. So who are you in this story? What is, what is the month of December? Like Some of you woke up today and you're like, oh my goodness, tomorrow's Christmas. Like this, this, this has gone by so fast. Perhaps for you, it's, it's a time to say, I need, I've been serving a lot. I've been, I've been, on, I've been serving every Sunday, or I've been, I've been putting in more hours at work, or I've been, I have been hurried. I have been telling everybody I know about Jesus. I, I'm Lori, making it rain, God loves you cars, telling everybody about Jesus. And that is awesome. There's a time for that. But then also there comes a time where balance is needed. Or perhaps there's a time where we need to be more like Mary. Pause, reflect, and soak it in. To not be so hurried. Both are equally good, but again, balance is needed. If you've been like Mary this whole Christmas season, maybe, maybe you took a month off from serving, or maybe you haven't served in a while, or maybe, or maybe you've just been reflecting and journaling and, and reading a lot this Christmas season, but you've not told a single person about why Christmas is so important. Maybe it's time to be more like the shepherds hurrying off and telling somebody about him. Doesn't mean being obnoxious. <laughs> but you don't really need a how-to either. The angels didn't say, hey, shepherds, let me give you a four-point class on how to tell people about what I just told you. No, because if you're like Lori, if you're like me, if you're like any one of us in this room that has a story, start with that. Just tell people your story. No one can argue life change in your life. I can't argue that Lori is a completely different person because of Jesus. And so start by just telling Jesus. Start with that. Tell people about what Jesus has done in your life. Speak up. Pray for one and then speak to the one. So church, what do we need to do? Do we need to slow down? Do we need to slow down to notice Jesus or do we need to start talking and telling others about Jesus? How are you going to respond to Jesus this Christmas season? This whole passage has worship through and through. The angels are worshiping. The shepherds are worshiping. Mary's worshiping and reflecting. I had this happen to me Friday night. I, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but in, in blue right here, that's a sermon illustration on my notes. I'm not going to read that to you. <laughs> because here's what happened. Friday night. Friday night, I was struggling. Thursday, if you guys were at Thursday night church, the Thursday experience, it was a train wreck. My mind was all over the place, and I, like, I was like ready to go home and like just, I don't know, like, eat a lot of food. I don't know. And uh, it was a train wreck. And so I was like, oh. So Friday night, I'm working on the sermon a little bit, and, uh, and I found this killer, killer example, killer closer. And I was like, it was going, I was going to come here, and you guys were all going to weep fall in love with Jesus, and revival was going to break out in Tom's River. It was going to be awesome. And I'm like working on my notes, and here's what happened. Ava was cooking. I was working on a Friday night, and my boys were at the table eating dinner. Ava's preparing for a party that we had with our staff. I'm working, and I, I went to tell her about this analogy, this, this illustration that I found. And as I'm telling her, I'm like, what a jerk. The very point I'm trying to make, I'm doing the antithesis right now. And so I was like, Ava, like, we're done. Like, I'm not working anymore. We have to pause and cook. We're going to go in there and have dinner with our kids. <laughs> So perhaps this Christmas season, perhaps we need to be a little bit more like Mary, to pause, reflect. And, and so that's my challenge to us, this, 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 to end the year, really. My challenge is cancel an appointment. <laughs> perhaps it's time to cancel an appointment, to, to allow for time to be more worshipful, to allow for time to focus more on Jesus. 
to think through what Jesus is really, well, he, he came to be a man and to, and to not just be okay with, oh, this is cool, this is a starry night and, and holy night and, and all the, like, like, not to get so caught up in the season that we lose sight of Jesus who is the reason for the season, that cliche of sorts, I just can't believe I said that, but he is. So how will you respond? Did you walk in here? Is this, is this one of few times that you come to church throughout the year? Thank you for coming to here. You could be anywhere else. Thank you for calling Wellspring home, even if it's just a few times a year. Thank you. But how will you respond? Are you amazed by God? What will you do with that re amazement? Perhaps it's time to now allow Jesus to be Savior, to be more than just a cool story. And so with that, I want to pray, and I'm going to invite some of you to say yes to Jesus for the first time. And then we're going to take communion together. Uh, after I get done praying, they're going to start passing out communion. And uh, don't open it or do anything with it yet. Just hold it and take that time, Carly and John, and, and they're going to they're sing a song. And, and it's not for us to sing with. It's for us to sit and just reflect. And then after that, we'll, we'll close with a song to, to have fun and to be shepherd-like in our worship. We'll do a little bit of both as we close. Let me pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for a time to reflect on you. <laughs> I thank you for a time, even now, just a quietness in this room. Father, for some of us, this is the quietest we've felt in, in the last month. <laughs> Father, you are God. And you loved us enough to send a son. Not to stay in a manger, but to be Jason's savior. Christ, Lord, and I thank you. Father, I thank you that all of the weight of my life deserves wrath. <laughs> and when I die, Father, it blows me away that you're not going to see my wrong. You're going to see Jesus. Thank you. And so, Father, I pray right now for people that have never said yes to relationship with you, that they've, they've, Christmas after Christmas after Christmas, they've been amazed by you, but they've done nothing with it. They've, they've slipped right back into life normal. They've slipped right back into their, their schedule and their tradition and, and, and all things but you. Father, this year, would amazement turn into submission? Would amazement turn into surrender? Would amazement say, Father, I'm going to let you be God? Father, for those in this room that are, it's, it's time to say yes to you, they simply pray something along these lines. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for being my Savior. I thank you for being Christ. I thank you for being Lord. Father, I am a sinner. I am wrong. I do deserve your wrath, and I thank you, Father, that you loved me so to send a son to die for me. Father, I accept it. Father, I accept that your son died in my place. I take that gift this Christmas season. Father, thank you. Today I live my life. I want to live my life in light of this. Changed in your name. Amen. If you prayed that, then I invite you to take communion with us as we celebrate Jesus. So in a moment, we'll take this together. But in the meantime, as they're passing it out, reflect on these words.